Welcome and greetings from Sacred Heart Monastery. My name is Sister Mary Beth Wensloff. I'm the prioress here and I'd like to welcome you to our gathering space, our front entrance of the monastery. So when you first walk into our doors here, one of the things that St. Benedict says is that all guests are to be received as Christ. So we want to make sure that all guests, all pilgrims, feel welcome here and, f and that we can find Christ in them. Today, when you walk in, the first thing that you see is our window right here. And this window was taken out of our original monastery. And when we built this new part of the monastery, we wanted to incorporate this somehow because it has our, our theme on it, one heart and one soul. Everything that we do here is ba based on community, so we try to be here together as one heart and one soul. It also has another Benedictine theme on there, Ora et Labora. It's the Latin words for pray and work. And so it's really important for us to live a balanced lifestyle. So we hope that when visitors walk into our house, that they will feel that sense of balance and peace and calm. Another thing that you're going to encounter at our front entrance is our switchboard receptionist. And that is a very important role in the Benedictine rule. One of the things that De Benedict devotes a whole chapter to uh, the term, the actual Benedictine term is called the portress. And it means the person who sits at the door. And so one of the things that, that honestly, it's probably one of the most important um, important roles within the Benedictine house and that is because that person is the one who will greet our visitors and to as I said before welcome them as if they were Christ so we hope that your encounter here will be a great one and that the entrance here will bring you much peace and joy so along this entire north wall of the chapel is what we call the parallel windows and each one of them has two sections. The upper part, the blue background, is a scene from the life and ministry of Jesus in scripture. And the lower one is always from either the stories about Saint Benedict in a writing that's called the Dialogues of Gregory. That was uh, Pope Gregory, who some think might have been a, a Benedictine himself before he was elected Pope. The shape of those is important. Uh, <coughs> You should imagine two overlapping circles, and the overlapping gives you that kind of an almond shape, and that's an indication of the overlapping of the divine world and our human world, where all of these things happen. So <clears throat> the first one here, and by the way, the, the writing in the windows is in Latin, because at the time the chapel was built, uh, the language of the church for mass and so on was still Latin. So at the top, Ego sum pastor bonus is Latin for I am the good shepherd. So you have the account in the Gospel of John of Jesus telling people, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, my sheep know me and they follow me. The lower section, St. Benedict is portrayed as he very often is. Sancta regula means the holy rule, so the rule that he wrote and the staff indicates that he is the leader of the community. So on the left and right, you have ones who followed Jesus according to the rule of St. Benedict for 15 centuries, monks. And on the right side, sisters, that was the traditional habit that the sisters were wearing at the time the chapel was, was built. And below, Sancte Pater Benedicte, Holy Father Benedict. You have two symbols in there that are very commonly associated with St. Benedict and they both have stories that Gregory tells about him. Up at the top, <clears throat> over St. Benedict's shoulder, you see this serpent coming out of a cup that's being cracked. St. Benedict started out as a hermit monk, which means he lived alone, and then people started coming to him, wanting to learn from him, and so community was formed. Well, the early community apparently wasn't quite as serious about living life dedicated to God as Benedict was. <laughs> so they thought, well, we'll poison him, uh, and that'll take care of that. So they, they traditionally drank wine at a meal, and Benedict would always bless it beforehand. 
So they gave him a cup of poisoned wine. He blessed it. It cracked. The serpent came out, so he knew it was poisoned. Well, obviously, he decided, I'm not staying with this bunch. So he left. He later started another community who had <clears throat> more faithful monks. The other symbol associated with St. Benedict, the raven, which is why the raven down in Roncalli is named as it is, Gregory has two stories there. One is that when Benedict was living as a hermit, he was so compassionate that he would share his daily portion of bread with the ravens that came to visit him. <clears throat> the other story is that there was a priest in the neighborhood, as Benedict was getting to be more well known, who was kind of jealous at Benedict's popularity. And so he had the idea too that he was going to poison him. So <clears throat> he gave a, a loaf of poisoned bread to Benedict, but a raven carried it off and saved St. Benedict. So <clears throat> that's the beginning of this long line. Down here, down the line, many of the scenes are from the life of St. Benedict. A few of them are from other Benedictine saints or important figures. So we'll go to another one that has another story from Gregory. We are now in the sanctuary of the Bishop Martin Marty Chapel, Memorial Chapel, and I'll take you right away to our baldacchino. This is called the baldacchino, and St. Peter's in Rome has it. Uh, the um, cathedral in Sioux Falls has a baldacchino. It, it sits above the high altar. In Vatican II, when, or before Vatican II, when the priest said his mass to, with his back to us, this was the altar. This green marble was the altar. And so the priest would, would face that way. The cross is made out of white oak, and it's got the four gospel writers in the four points of the arm of the church. The altar cloth, or the cloth behind the cross always is indicative of the liturgical season, the color of the liturgical season. So during ordinary time, it would be green. Right now, it is, was set up for um, Palm Sunday, so that was red. During the Easter season, it will be white. But the color of the liturgical season is an important thing for us, so that will always be indicated by the back color on the cloth. If you notice above, there are four, actually five angels, one on each corner of the baldacchino, and that is to signify that the angels are all around us and protecting us and watching out for us and always with us to be with us in our time of prayer. In the, the very top apex, the corner up there, there are two, um, help me out here. All those birds, peacocks, sorry. In the top apex, there are two peacocks. And you're asking, why would peacocks be in a chapel? Actually, a peacock is a symbol for immortality. So the closer we get to God with going up to the tip, it's showing that with God there is immortality and that we will always be alive with him. And they are drinking from the font of the water of life. So it encourages us during church to also drink from that same water of life so that we can share in the immortality with, with God. Around the circular part of the baldacchino, right above the, the cross, is a symbol of all of the sacraments. So you have marriage in there, the key, uh, holy orders. So if you take time to look at and those, those are, are symbolized right there. So, as you look to both of these doors, the doors that lead out toward the, toward the sacristy, and the doors that come over from Bishop Marty Chapel, 
these are some of the ways that the in, ingrained in the wood are some of the ways that our early apostles were martyred. So you see an axe, you see a crucifix upside down. Peter was crucified upside down because he said that he was not worthy to be um, to die in the same way that our Lord was. So he asked to be crucified upside down. So it's a it's a witness to us to put our lives on the line as the early apostles did for their beliefs. Hello everyone. So I'm get to speak about liturgy and our organ. And as you may have heard from your class, prayer and work is our Benedictine motto. And prayer is definitely central to our life, the Liturgy of the Hours, and the Eucharist. With worship come words and rituals, standing, sitting, bowing, kneeling. And to accompany the words we sing, Augustine says singing is praying twice. Along with our singing is our accompaniment. And the organ for hundreds of years has been the traditional mode of accompanying our music. Also at the back of our church, at the back of Bishop Marty Chapel, is a little room that's dedicated to artifacts from Bishop Martin Marty. As you can see, Bishop Martin Marty was the first bishop of the Dakota Territory. And so, Yankton right here was our, was the seat of that diocese of the Dakota Territory. So one of the things that's important is in any cathedral is a chair called the cathedra. And the cathedra is the bishop's chair. So we actually have Bishop Martin Marty's original chair that he had when he was the bishop here at Yankton. So it's over a hundred years old. We don't allow people to sit on it because we want to preserve that um, in, its, in its beautiful state. The windows over here, the stained glass windows, depict a lot of who Bishop Martin Marty was. He was known as Black Robe Lean Chief because he worked very closely with the Native Americans and he was able to um, build a great relationship with the United States government and with the Native American people but he also tried to uh, bring them religion. And so in the second window here, the second window up, you see him, he was a musician, he played the organ, and he brought music to the Dakota Territory. So the, the one over here is when he's out with the sod houses, meeting and greeting the people of the prairie back in the 1800s. So take some time to spend back here and learn a little bit more about Bishop Martin Marty. As we come down the stairs from the balcony in the Bishop Marty Chapel, we see our wall right here that depicts all of the, all of the sisters that have died since, since the very beginning. So there are some sisters that were born in the 1700s that are here, but we came here in 1880, so our cemetery out to the west of our monastery that's where all of these sisters, most of these sisters are buried, but uh, it's a real sense of prayer knowing that all these sisters have gone before us and are still with us in our hearts and our spirit. Well, welcome to the balcony of the Bishop Marty Chapel. Most large churches have a rose window, a round window in their, in their balcony of their church. We do not. We instead have this beautiful set of windows that were donated by one of our Mount Marty College alumni. All of these windows up here depict our Swiss sisters. Since we are from Switzerland, when the Swiss sisters came over to this area, they did what they knew from Switzerland. So these windows depicted a lot of what the sisters were doing when they first came over to the United States. So I won't go through all of them, but I would encourage you sometime to, if you have a little bit of time, to come over and just come up here and spend some time with these so that you know what our original sisters from Switzerland were doing when they first came here. I'll just give you a couple uh, of my very favorites. One, there are bees. The sisters were beekeepers and also gardeners. 
They were woodworkers. They worked with the wood. They cooked. They, uh, I love this. They worked with the Native Americans. And then the next one right over is that they played croquet. And that one says to me, uh, our theme, uh, Benedictine theme is Ora et Labora, pray and work. But there's also an element that you have to have a sense of leisure. I always call it play aura, aura et labora et play aura. And that leisure balances out that prayer and work time. So our sisters knew that. Well, this is our holy water font leading into our chapel. And even though we don't do baptisms here, this font serves as a reminder of our baptism and which is carried out in our profession, monastic profession. The font is made of South Dakota carnelian granite that was quarried near Mill Bank. The main bowl, or the main part of the font, has eight sides to it, representing the seven days of creation and the eighth day of resurrection. The upper font, which the Easter candle can be placed in, has an upper pool that will flow around that candle and then out seven riverlets which are symbolic of the seven sacraments or the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it uh, was done by Rausch Brothers in Mill Bank. I did the design on the font. And so it sits as a centerpiece in the gathering space and also sits in the middle of the logo from the chapel, which we have carried through out the space when we did our renovation. It's just a geometric space but the circle again that circle of eternity and the font is sitting in the middle of that hi i'm sister catherine and i'm here to show you our chapter room now if you wonder what chapter means for us uh, it means when all the sisters gather together we have chapter meetings nobody ever misses them because we're all expected to be there we all want to be there to see each other and to help carry on the business of the monastery and our monastic life so I'm going to take you around this room first, and then I'm going to tell you different ways that this room is used. So the first thing we have here is simply the lineup of all the bishops in our diocese that have ever served in our diocese. Now, we have a new bishop over here after Bishop Swain. Uh, he, bishops determine a, what's going to be their official uh, picture as a bishop. And a de Groot evidently doesn't have one because as soon as he gets one, then he mails it out or the parishes can all order it. The schools, everybody will have a picture of the bishop. So this is our, these two are retired and all the rest of them have died, beginning with Bishop Dudley. And so this particular cross was made in 1960 and every sister that was a member of our community at that time put a piece of mosaic into this cross. So it really does uh, reflect Christ who is central to our lives. Uh, from the rule of the Benedicts, it preferred nothing whatever to Christ. So it's very important to have in our room, but it's also part of each one of us because we each put a mosaic in it. So that's pretty special to us. This is Mother Jerome's desk. Mother Jerome was one of the prioresses. She was prioress for um, 29 years. Now, usually the sisters have a, that's a picture of her up there on the top. Usually you have a four-year terms, two four-year terms. Now we have one six-year term. So when you have 29 years, you have to actually go to Rome and get permission to serve that long. So Mother Jerome uh, was just simply a legend in our community. There are there have been 14 prioresses from the beginning, 1880, up until Sister Mary Beth, who is a prioress now, and she'll serve uh, one six-year term because that's what we're on now, all right? Now, I want to just kind of give you a view of this room. It's very big. We have the audio part that comes down out of the ceiling. We can do a lot of things. We can hear, uh, see movies, you know, give presentations. So the next thing, uh, besides the sisters meeting here, we have professional groups come in, like Avera Sacred Heart can meet here, Mount Marty College people meet here, the professionals for different things. It's a very sacred place to us because of what we do here as a monastic community when we have chapter, but it's still a very holy place to us because this is where we play 
and it's what we share. It's a hospitality place where we can invite other groups to come in and use this beautiful space. Hi, my name is Sister Clarice, and today I'm going to talk to you about a room in the monastery called the refectory. Most people call it a dining room, but refectory is a monastic term. It's from a Latin word, refecere, which means to remake or to restore. So people come to this room to be restored, to be fed. So we come from the chapel, where we're fed spiritually, and here, where we're fed physically. And it, another connection in the refectory to the chapel are the stained glass windows. And in between the windows are phrases or quotes. And with these stained glass windows, the phrase kind of connects with the window. So we give thee thanks, almighty God, for all thy gifts. And so we've got an example of the gifts that we have from God. And other phrases go on with it too. Give us this day our daily bread, obviously, the bread. So that's on one side of the refectory. And over on this side, these paintings and calligraphy have to do with what's called the Paschal Mystery. That is the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So we have the Nativity on the far left, the death and resurrection, excuse me, and the coming of the Holy Spirit with the seven gifts coming from the Holy Spirit. So the sisters eat their meals here. This is a dietary kitchen. In this kitchen, we cook all the, the meals for the sisters in the dining room here and in the care center area. We cook a variety of, of soups and pa pa pastas and meats and desserts. And um, we wash the dish, the pots and pans in here. We take, we take care of the breads for out here. Um, we also take care of the fresh vegetables in this this kitchen here. We make sure that the, the salads. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Sister Marietta, and welcome to the Monastery Bakery. And here are some of its great cookies. In the making and preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That Sister Marie is a awesome, a wonderful collage. Cookies, anticipation of rolls. Okay. This is the big machine, which could uh, mix bread. You could put it up to 50 pounds of flour in there and mix up that many loaves of bread at one time. We don't use it very often anymore because we are smaller in number now than we were then. I love to tell the story of this oven. They actually, the bakery got built around the oven because it's such an immovable piece. And is there something in here, Martin? All right. It has five shelves that rotate around when the oven is on. So on the day before Christmas, when the world was tense, I was working in the bakery, we had a gigantic can of brownies to bake. I opened it up, slid the pan in, and it caught on the top, came down in brownies, spread all the way through the dump. I was not the favorite novice. And in order to clean that, the person has to get on one of these shelves and dry down to the bottom. There's no other way to clean it. So it was an adventure, yeah, a lesson. We have the warmers back here, with which we put the loaves of bread to warm and rise. Most important, of course, is having a baker to start with in that system already. And this is a machine that needs the bread. So we put the dough here and and send it through, and it rotates it and needs bread. Well, hi. 
we're in the Peace Center, Benedictine Peace Center. And this space in our monastery is devoted to retreats. We're going to say a little more about retreats later, what you do there. But it's a place where we can practice Benedictine hospitality that you read about, chapter 53 of the rule, to welcome all guests as Christ and uh, give them a space to pray and be. And uh, so, uh, some of our staff is here, Sister mm -hmm. Penny Bingham, Sister Mary Jo Polak, uh, Sister Doris can't be with us today, she's got another commitment. I'm Sister Jean Ronick. Okay. And that piece that Sister Jean mentioned is, um, that's Peace Center, and that's what we invite people to come here to share, is that time of quiet and solitude, a time of peace, the peace that only God can give. Um, we're open to people of all faiths. We welcome people of all faith traditions. Um, and we have we offer our, our quiet area, and these the spaces that we'll show you for your time, your quiet time with the Lord. So sometimes if you feel like you need to get re refocused in your life, whether uh, now as a student or your senior year when you're trying to figure out what to do, um, you might think about contacting us or uh, either for a retreat time or to talk to someone for spiritual direction, uh, which would be meeting with someone to talk about God and your values. This would be one of the bedrooms uh, for retreatants to stay in. And we have seven rooms like this. Um, the guest department, I don't think you saw a bedroom down there, but it's a similar layout, except that we also have two larger rooms in the guest department that would accommodate families. Welcome into our meditation area. This is just a, another quiet space for people to be in, to pray in, just to have that time to, to meditate, to be with the Lord. And it's just adjacent to our Peace Center. We've got cushions. Some people find that more comfortable, or chairs, scripture. Good afternoon. Welcome to our monastery gift shop. I'm Novice Teresa here at Sacred Heart Monastery, and this is our gift shop where we have for every occasion for baby congratulations, first communions, confirmations, weddings. We have sisters who have made their own jewelry. Sister Marielle makes beautiful handmade jewelry. Sister Kit makes fine crystal cut glass items. She makes angels, chimes, and nativity sets over here. This is the Monastery Library, and I'm Sister Lynn. And like any library, the Monastery Library has books, videos, DVDs, magazines, newspapers, and things like that for the sisters to read. And Benedict in his rule in chapter 48 talks about reading and he's talking about the daily manual labor. From the 1st of October to the beginning of Lent, the brothers ought to devote themselves to reading until the end of the second hour. At the first signal for the hour of noon, all put aside their work to be ready for the second signal. Then after their meal, they will devote themselves to their reading or to the Psalms. During the days of Lent, they should be free in the morning to read until the third hour, after which they will work at their assigned tasks until the tenth hour. During this time of Lent, each one is to receive a book from the library and is to read the whole of it straight through. These books are to be distributed at the beginning of Lent. And what's interesting about that is further on in that chapter, Benedict talks about he doesn't go so much to make sure they're working and doing their work, but that they're doing their reading and praying. And in Benedict's time, people did not read. They were illiterate, so they had to learn to read. They memorized the Psalms. And so today we do encourage reading, whether it's on a tablet or in paper or on a computer or watching things, but to somehow develop the mind in, in your inner life and your spirituality. Yeah, as Benedictines, we are very immersed in our history and our lineage. And this is where we keep the records of our history. Uh, St. Benedict tells us to teach 
to treat all things as vessels of the altar, and much of our work is preserving this for future generations so Benedictines and researchers will both have access to it. And we keep legal documents, which can be dry reading some, some days, but we also keep other documents that talk about our daily lives and more fun stuff. And this is a chronicle entry from 1896, which talks about the what they did for the Feast of St. Benedict. So it's over 130 years old, talking about the feast, and we still write about the Feast of Benedict in our daily, in our daily chronicles. And we also keep a lot of photographs, which are valuable to illustrate our history. And this is a photograph of the first building the sisters lived in when they came to South Dakota in 1881. And this building was both the living quarters and where they taught. It was the classroom area. And then in 1892, a decade later, this is the same location and that's their their classroom building with all the students and faculty, priests and sisters gathered in front of the school. So we can see some of the changes, sorry I dropped, almost dropped it, some of the changes that's happened in our history just by looking at the progression of buildings and where our sisters have been and where we've left, left hopefully our footprints of the Benedictine spirituality. So that is a large part of our mission and what we do. We are keepers of the history. All right, well, hello there. Welcome to uh, my display cases. This has been uh, a ministry of mine for about 20 years. My thought is to feature the liturgical year as well as the seasons, feast days, uh, special occasions. So since this is Holy Week, I have uh, this uh, arrangement, purple for Christ's passion. I have a corpus from uh, Africa and of course the cross. And come next Saturday, this will all change and will break out into Easter with a glorified cross and uh, oh, some eggs and flowers and maybe a rabbit. Um, and over here, um, I, I kind of am uh, anticipating May with the Blessed Mother and I consider her color blue, so I have a lot of blue glass and arranging them. Uh, then up above I have uh, uh, my own work. Um, Benedict has a chapter devoted to the craftsmen of the monastery, chapter 57. <coughs> So he too thought the liberal arts was important. And they're simply little shapes of triangles and gems and uh, I call them Christmas gestures. They have an attitude of reverence to them. Hi, I'm Sister Louise Marie and I work in the Monastery Art Room. And this is it. I, um, the purpose of this is to restore all the art we have in our monastery and um, to move it around to different walls and of the monastery hallways so people get a little cheered up. I made a listing of all the things we have so far and I'm up to about 489 and so that's a lot to keep track of. What isn't on the wall or in somebody's room is, is stacked in cupboards and shelves and all over the place. Well, St. Benedict said in his um, rule of St. Uh, the Holy Rule on chapter 57 that we are to use our gifts that God has given us with all humility and reverence. And that word reverence kind of runs through St. Benedict's rule all the way through, if you look at it, because it's also the care of things. 
and that's what this my job is all about is to care for the art of the monastery sometimes I have to reframe sometimes I have to toss out because it's all gone we have a, uh, the art consists of the work of many sisters in our community who are gifted artists Every, there are 75 sisters here in the monastery, and because that's too many to have recreation together, we have recreation every single night, so we've broken down into smaller living groups. And every living group has a special space where they can come together just to relax. So over here we have a living area together. Um, so they pray here at noon and after supper every day. Sometimes we watch TV, watch a movie. Okay, so there's a living room area. And then there is a dining room area where Saturday nights the, the group eats their supper together. And just about every night this group here plays cards. And so you, you see the sisters relaxing. Every group room has a, a complete kitchen so that the meal can be prepared in here and served in the dining room. Okay, the sewing room is an important part in the monastery. In this day and age though, where people buy things already made, it's not quite as much. But people do like to get a hold of homemade uh, artisan things. Pillowcases, whatever it is, things for hanging back there. There's. Uh, a pillow that's upside down, that's terrific. Hi, this is our exercise room, and this is a place where sisters are welcome to come, especially when the weather's not nice outside and we can get outside and walk. A lot of people come here to use the equipment, and you know, this fits in very well with St. Benedict's concern for a balanced life, for the health and wholeness of each one of us body, mind, and spirit. So this is a way that we can uh, develop ourselves physically, which St. Benedict's St. Benedict encourages us to do. The monastery patio is a place, a quiet place for the sisters to come, watch the um, nature, the birds, the squirrels, and any other wildlife that might be out. Also a quiet place for prayer and um, Many times meetings are held in here by the sisters or family gatherings or other special events. So these are the feder Federation offices. Um, we, Sacred Heart Monastery, is a member of the Federation of St. Gertrude. St. Gertrude was a 12th century Benedictine nun who lived in what's now Germany and she was a spiritual leader and a mystic. There are 14 monasteries that belong to the Federation of St. Gertrude, and these monasteries range geographically from Eastern Kentucky to British Columbia. I am currently the president of the Federation of St. Gertrude, that's an elected position, and I have a six-year term as president, so I'm about in the middle of that. The office of the Federation of St. Gertrude is wherever the president is, so that's why the offices are here at Sacred Heart Monastery. This is our business office, and where our monastery business is, takes place with our lay employees. The offices down this hallway are um, mainly business support uh, staff, and then the offices around this side are our um, administrative team, the priors, the sub priors, and the procurator, and they're the ones who um, are in charge around here. <laughs> so they have their duties to be done. And I work as one of the support staff and then also run the gift shop. Uh, we greet our, our guests in the parlor. And in this first parlor here, we have um, some 
remembrances of the African people because we had a sister, sisters from Africa that attended our college. So the paintings on the wall. And the candlesticks over here. We like to put um, the tree of life, you know, their family on the candlesticks. And the wooden bowl over here. And notice the crucifix on the wall also. Beautiful wood carvings. And it's a reminder too when we meet the guests, St. Benedict says you treat all guests as Christ. Bishop Marty called some of the sisters from Missouri to go up to the Indian Mission at Fort Eads, North Dakota. And so these are some memories of our work with the Indian people. We had missions at Stefan and Chamberlain as well. Yes, that's the dream catcher. And uh, the Indian people calm their little children at night by filtering out the bad dreams. And this is the wood carrier. And St. Benedict reminds, you know, um, a monk who works with his hands is truly a monk. And I love this picture over here of the horses. There's so much energy and beautiful color in that painting. This is what we call St. Joseph's Care Center. This is the dining room that we do have the sisters eat in. And usually we have anywhere from 18 to 20 of them. And then uh, we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. And then when you look down this hallway, this is where the Care Center sisters live. We have a capability of having 28 of them. We also have a whirlpool room that we give them whirlpools in. We have a physical therapist that comes and does physical therapy. We have a speech therapist, an occupational therapist that comes if we need them. We have 24-7 nursing care here. And um, they can come and go as they want. We have some that require um, wheelchairs and some that use walkers. But otherwise, the living groups are all here and they have individual uh, rooms. And the nurse's station is in the middle. And that's basically what the living in group here is like. This is St. Joseph Chapel, and it's adjacent to St. Joseph Care Center, which is the care center where we have 14 sisters living, uh, and this, the chapel is for them, for their morning prayer and their evening prayer, and for the celebration of the Eucharist each day. Every day, the care center sisters come G59. here to the activity room, and G59. they have activity. Every Tuesday, they play bingo. M38. So they have a, a time to get out of the care center and get stretch their legs a little bit and have a little bit of activity. Houses of this era also had back stairs and front stairs. We'll show you the front stairs in a minute. But the back stairs were typically for the servants. Well, the priests didn't have servants per se but it was easy for the people who took care of the house to come up and down quickly and then usually the um, residents, the actual residents of the house used the front stairs. The house was upgraded in the uh, late 1900-2000 to have uh, wiring for wireless computing, for networking, for new plumbing and for electronics and for new telephone lines. So the ceilings in here were lowered to 10 feet high, which is the top of the windows, so that we could put duct work and uh, electrical and piping in here to accommodate the rest of the house. This wall right here used to be a fireplace, but uh, they used this also to run piping up and down between the top floor and the cellar, as well as the first floor. This is our dining room. This is a laundry room in here. 
So all the comforts of home, this is now the residence of our residential volunteer program. So now we're in the main part of the house. Um, this is our dinner bell over here. Uh, when we do have dinners in the house, we use the dinner bell actually to call people to eat. This is original, of course, and you can see somebody didn't measure it quite right. Nobody ever fixed it over the years. It isn't because the house has settled. It just is the way it was, and uh, it's kind of a nice little feature. All of the molding and the wallpaper is original, and it's really just a cheap pine type wood and it has like a, a like a decoupage put on top of it to make a, a kind of a stain type of a look. I'll take you to the front door before I take you into the living room. So you can see here our main entrance and our main stairwell to the house. Um, apparently there's a, a little legend that if you get the acorn on the bottom of your banister it means that the original owner paid for the house. If you don't have an acorn the, apparently the loan was still outstanding when the house was sold. But anyway, this is the front entrance. Uh, this piece of furniture is probably from the era of Martin Marty, but might not have been actually used by Martin Marty. We don't know. But we have several items of furniture of this vintage, and we keep it in the house kind of because it goes with the house. These are the original front doors. You can just stay there and... Uh, and these are the original front doors. However, they, we didn't have uh, a closed-in porch. We have it screened in now, but the actual porch was there originally. And this is the original glass. You can come on into this room. This is a, a bedroom that is used, uh, well, actually, it's hardly used at all. But if we have a residential volunteer that has difficulty with stairs, that person would get this particular bedroom. It's uh, this entire house is handicap accessible, and um, so and this is could have been Martin Marty's uh, bed. It's a, not exactly a double bed, but it's not exactly a single bed, and it has a little Indian symbol up here, so it could have easily been his bed. And then the same thing with this furniture with the marble top. And if you come on in, there's a, one of the fireplaces from the original house is still here. It's non-functional but uh, there was a fireplace. So there were three fireplaces on the main floor. There were no fireplaces upstairs. And then we come into the living room. Uh, the living room, the ceilings in the living room were lowered somewhat, but they're still about 11 feet tall as opposed to 12 feet tall. You'll notice the windows on the front of the house go all the way down to the floor. The windows on the side of the house go down not quite as far, but all of the windows in the house are easily uh, viewable to the person inside. In other words, you don't have to get up to look out the window, and that's a really nice feature. And then it's really nice to have the, the, the floor-to-ceiling windows just for viewing uh, when you're sitting around. And we, of course, we have lots of birds. All the rooms have ceiling fans because it gets... It's nice to circulate the air conditioning or circulate the heat because the ceilings are so high. Then we have, in this room, uh, we have uh, uh, one of the three fireplaces. This is still a working fireplace. We don't use it because the, the chimney needs to be replaced. But it, it is a working fireplace. And uh, this is often the room where we pray. The living room where we have the television is where we might sit and relax and watch TV. In this room, this room was added. These are exterior walls here. As you can see, they're a foot thick. And um, this room was added when we had a particular chaplain who felt the house was too dark. And so he wanted, so they popped, there used to be a window here and the wall. But he popped this out and made this kind of a sunroom and, um, for that time. So it's kind of stayed. Uh, we didn't ever make it go back to the original style of the house, but it does brighten up the house and as you can see, we kind of use it as a little greenhouse. <laughs> I'm Sister Rosemary and I'd like to introduce you to the Peace Chapel. The Peace Chapel is directly below Bishop Marty Chapel uh, and it is the worship space that the sisters use to pray Liturgy of the Hours and to celebrate Mass on weekdays. It's also used by the college students for various activities as their chapel. This is where we have our student mass at 4 p.m. on Sundays when school is in session. The decor in the chapel 
reflects a Native American motif with the painted geometric designs on the aisle ceiling and brilliant colors of the windows. This chapel was a very dark space for many years. The, the tile on the floor was dark brown and the pews were brown and the ceilings were all that Native American motif. In the 1980s, we renovated the space, we removed the pews, we added carpet and the sturdy chairs to, uh, to give it a warmer feeling. In 2017, we made another renovation and we created the curved space along the north side to create an environment that would bring the worshiping community closer together. And then we have, on the east end here, we have a, a small Blessed Sacrament Chapel. The Blessed Sacrament is reserved in the tabernacle here. And this is a very nice place for, uh, to come for personal prayer and just some quiet time. The Monastery Orchard is home to a variety of apple trees, pear, plum, uh, peach, and apricot, and also cherries. So we pick fruit throughout the summer into the fall months. We also have a large garden where we grow a variety of vegetables and fruits, including asparagus and rhubarb, and all kinds of squash, pumpkins, peas, beans, you name it, we may have grown it at some time. Also at the end of the garden we have a pollinator habitat which we um, grow wildflowers to encourage the bees um, and other pollinators to come. We have two rows of grapevines which we um, harvest every summer and so uh, many hours are spent here and Benedict said to take care um, to be a true monk, you um, live by the work of your hands, and so uh, gardening is one way in which we can provide food for our sisters and uh, care for the earth. Each spring, we um, hatch our own chickens, and we um, raise them in the summers in this chicken house and run. They um, love to eat the grass and oats from our garden, and um, they are a special project for our care center sisters and um, they enjoy having chicken soup. They also enjoy watching them hatch and um, being able to see them as small chicks. Okay, I'm here at a very special place, a very holy place on the monastery grounds. This is St. Benedict over here and his twin sister Scholastica who are welcoming Sacred Heart Monastery Cemetery. Some of the, when I was going through here, just to remember many of the sisters that I have known, uh, it's over half of this uh, cemetery. The sisters have died since I've been in community. And something important is down by the crucifix, uh, there's an area, and that is an area that was reserved for burying our prioresses. The prioress is a sister who kind of is like a president of the community. She's the boss. And so our, the ones that we have, we've had 14 prioresses in our history, and seven of them uh, will be buried down there. We have seven sisters, seven prioresses, remaining living in our community right now. So these represent all the sisters that have been part of Sacred Heart Monastery. One thing I think is important is to remember that uh, a cemetery is holy ground and it should be treated as such. Uh, in this area right here, there's a sidewalk and it circles all the way around here and that is, that's prayer ground for the sisters. The sisters come out here to meditate and to pray and it's not a, because it's green space doesn't mean that it's for playing ball or whatever. It is a prayer ground and you know anyone's welcome to come and pray and you can pray for all of us. <laughs>